name's Jillian. I'm going to be talking about black box testing with RSpec and Capybara. Um, I'll be using examples in Capybara and RSpec, but a lot of this is applicable to testing in general or um, uh, web uh, UI testing in general. So a quick uh, intro to what Capybara is. Um, it's a DSL for testing web applications that simulates how a real user would interact with your application. So it has methods like fill in and click button. One of the common methods you'll see is, is find, where you pass in a CSS selector, and um, it will return a capybara element, which you can then do things to, like click or get the text or the value of it. Um, and then it has a bunch of predicate methods that are useful in um, RSpec, like has content, has CSS, has link, has button. So I'm gonna be going through an example with a simple registration form. So there's the HTML for it, and this is what the uh, form looks like. We'll say that this is for like a shopping app. Your first step at a spec for this might look like this. You're registering a user, uh, you're using Capybara's methods, visit, fill in email, fill in password, click button save, and expect there not to be an error. So this is pretty readable for now, um, and if this were the only page in your application, this might be sufficient. But then we quickly start adding other specs. So now we're editing a user profile, but we need a registered user first. So we visit, fill in email, fill in password, save to register a user, and then our profile um, editing test is at the bottom of this. And then you keep adding more specs. So there's our registering a user spec, or visiting, fill in email, fill in password, save. Editing a user profile, visit, fill in email, fill in password, save. And now we're accessing the order history page, but you need a registered user, so visit, fill in email, fill in password, save. And now we're saving an item to a wish list, but we need a registered user to save it to, so visit, fill in email, fill in password, save. So this may look obviously bad when you put it all together like this, but if you think about your own codes, or your own tests, do you have the same couple lines of code at, this, at the top of every test? Um, I think the reason that this is pervasive in test code is that we think of tests as kind of an accessory um, to our code and don't think of them as code themselves. Um, but they are code and bad tests will end up with the same problems as bad application code. So the problems here um, are that these tests are not dry. So you're going to have all the issues that you have with code that's not dry. If you have a UI change or a refactoring, you're going to have to change all four of these tests instead of just changing it in one place. Um, it's difficult to read and it obscures the purpose of the test. So you, um, uh, when you look at this, like this wish list test, you see all this registration stuff at the top, you have to figure out, oh, we need a registered user for this test, and then the actual meat of the test is at the bottom, so it's a little confusing. One remedy for this repetition in your test code um, is the page object pattern. Martin Fowler has a good blog post on this. I feel like every talk has mentioned Martin Fowler, so I had to as well. Um, <laughs> You can, so the idea is that you can define a class for each page and use it to store the logic for how to interact with the page. And then it's easy to reuse uh, those methods and uh, any time you have to interact with that page. And if there's a, any change to the interface, you only have to update, update it in one page object instead of a lot of tests. You can also optimize slow tests more easily this way because you can change it in just one place instead of having to hunt through the whole test suite for places to improve. So here's an example for the registration page that we just looked, at, looked at. It includes the Capybara DSL, it stores the URL for the page and just calls Capybara's visit method um, without having to pass in the URL. There's a register method that has those familiar visit, fill in email, fill in password, save. And then we've wrapped the CSS for the expected error and it has no flash error method uh, for use in the test. So now our test looks like this. Um, we are registering a user, we initialize a registration page and just call register and expect there to be no flash error. So this is a little bit easier to read. It wasn't too terrible before, but it's still easier now. And we have no CSS selectors and no UI elements. We don't care what the page looks like at all. If you make changes to the page, you don't have to change the test at all. You just have to change the page object. More importantly now, we can simplify those other specs. So here's the user profile spec that we saw before. And now it's clear that you're registering a user at the top. You don't have to parse those four lines to figure out what's going on. And uh, the meat of the test, the visit profile, um, and expect that uh, the right things happen, is what you see when you go to the test. Same with these other tests. The registration page is just one line now. So now you might want to make page objects for those other pages as well, the edit profile page or the order history page or, or other pages. So we'll look at the registration page again. 
and uh, let's see what might be shared between other pages. This uh, URL saving and visiting, um, calling to Capybara's visit method, you'll probably see that in all of your pages. This has no flash error. You might have the same um, CSS for any error box that pops up anywhere in your application. And this include Capybara DSL. Also, you might see in most, you might want in most of these pages, so you get all the Capybara methods on your object. So the simplest way to do this is just with inheritance. You can make a page-based object uh, that handle, that has a URL handling in a slightly different way. Um, now you have a uh, um, parameter instead of a constant. And it calls Capybara's visit method. And then you can add more onto this, like uh, the error handling for flash errors. So I did promise some Capybara tips. Um, here's one of them. Um, see the, that there are two methods for has flash error and has no flash error, and they use has CSS and has no CSS in Capybara. You might wonder why you have both of those instead of just expecting the first one to be false. The reason is due to performance optimization. Capybara will wait for those uh, methods to be true, so that it'll wait for things to load on the page uh, and that kind of thing. So if you are um, having, if you have a failing, or a, a test that passes on the negative condition, you wanna use has no CSS so that it will pass as soon as it's not visible on the page instead of waiting that default wait time and only passing at the end. So if you are using Capybara and you have tests that you can't, that are taking a while or always taking 30 seconds and that happens to be your configured wait time, you should look for this in your, in your code. So now that we've made the pa base page object, we can simplify the registration page to only include things that are specific to the registration page. So we have that um, URL for it and a register method and we don't have all that extra capybara um, stuff in it. So this is the simplest way to do this. Another way that uh, might be preferable to inheritance in this case would be uh, using modules. So you could have a visitable module um, and an errorable module or something uh, that you could include on the page objects that use them. And that way, if you have um, sections of pages that don't necessarily have a URL that you can visit or pages that are never gonna have an error on them, you're not loading that page object with unnecessary stuff. So I have been referring to this so far as page objects, but a lot of times you're gonna to wanna to make uh, objects and classes for um, sections of pages instead of entire pages. So headers and footers would be an example of that. That's gonna be shared across a lot of different pages, so you'll wanna have that in a separate class. Or even on sections that aren't shared between pages, your page objects can get bloated with too many different um, elements and you'll wanna separate them out into page sections. So dialogue boxes that pop up, those kinds of things. And so here's a hypothetical edit name dialog that pops up on the edit profile page we talked about earlier. Uh, just simple first name, last name, save, pretty similar to the register page. So we wanna make a page section for that. Here's some possible code for that. So I mentioned earlier that Capybara's find method, and there are other finder methods like first and all that will, re that will return this, but it returns a Capybara element that then has helpful methods like um, click and fill in and get the value of it and that kind of thing. But sometimes you might wanna add custom methods to those sections once you uh, get them, uh, once you find them with the finder method. Um, so inheriting from, inheriting directly from element won't work in that case because the find method will give you an element instead of your new edit dialog class. So a handy way to do this is with delegate class. Uh, that's in Ruby standard library. It's in uh, Fordable, I think. Um, and so this will take an instance of the class and it's initialized and delegate any um, undefined method to the class, but you can add additional methods to it. So here's the example for the edit dialog. You can just delegate to Capybara element, um, use Capybara's finder and the initialize, and then add an edit name method um, that makes it easier to fill in that dialog. So we talked about how to make page sections to share across multiple pages, but you might have pages that or elements that are really similar but not quite identical. So if we look at the edit dialog that we just looked at and the register page, these both have a couple of form fields and a save button. Um, so it would be helpful to have a form object that you could just pass like a symbol for what you wanna call that uh, first name field and last name field and then the labels that you're looking for. So this is what you want, is a form that can take those um, and have uh, a few methods like first name field, last name field, and fill in form that you could pass first name and what you want filled in and last name and what you want filled in. And same thing on that 
um, email page. And then you could use this in your page object like this. I'll show you the implementation of form in a minute, but this is how you, how you would use it. Um, you include forwardable and then delegate uh, the field method names to that form, and you'll automatically have first name field and fill in form. And you can use fill in form in that register method instead of having to call all of the fields individually. So it just saves a little bit of time in the, in the implementation of your page object. So I'm gonna show you the implementation of form. Don't worry about absorbing every little bit of this code. Um, it's just, I'll talk through it and um, it's, uh, I'm just trying to give you the general idea and not, not necessarily the details. So here are the public methods. We can initialize it by passing in the fields hash like we saw on the last slide and calling a private method that I'll show you in a minute. And then we have the fill in form method that takes the values to fill in and sets each of the fields. So it tries to call like first name field, last name field and set those. So here are the private methods. Uh, there's one that's not on here, so you won't actually be able to parse this whole thing, but the, it boils down to a pretty simple define method. Um, so really basic metaprogramming, uh, call define method to define each of those field method names. So now I've shown you the page object pattern and some tips for implementing it. I've shown you page sections that are identical and page sections that are uh, slightly different. So I wanted to give kind of an inspirational slide with a real example from um, our application um, at Converge. So you've never seen our, our, this page before, you've never seen our application, but I think you can probably tell exactly what's going on in this spec just from reading it, uh, which is really useful if you have new people coming on board and trying to look at your tests and figure out what was the purpose of this test to begin with. If you have clear methods like this, it's easy to see. So we're visiting the inventory page, opening the inventory tab, searching for a device, adding it, submitting, and then expecting it to have been successful. Open the detail tab and expect one device to be there. Um, there are only two strings in this and they're specific to the test, not the application under test. So there's no CSS selectors, there's nothing that talks about a specific form field or um, text that you're expecting to see on the page. So if you need to change anything in this test, or in the, in the inventory page, you just change it in the page object and not in this test. And this is how this looked, uh, this looks without using page objects. You can't really tell what's going on. You can see from all the green that there are all sorts of magic strings in there. Some of them are repeated even just within this one test and that would get worse when you add multiple tests that interact with the page. And it's just generally a mess. So page objects really cleaned this up and made it more readable and clear. Uh, running a little early, so I'm wrapping up already. <laughs> uh, so what I wanna leave you with is that tests are code. They're not exempt from the rules of code. The rules are anything you'd follow in your application code. And the one that I've been kind of going over the most today is don't repeat yourself. Um, store all the logic in one place for interacting with your pages instead of in every test. The reason for this is that badly written tests can, can cause more maintenance problems than badly written application code because they'll prevent refactoring of your code. So if your tests are preventing refactoring of your business code, uh, they're failing you, even if they're passing. So your tests must change less often than your business code to prevent this. And that implies that tests actually maybe need better software engineering discipline than, uh, than your business code. So this is uh, me, I didn't have any like uh, gifts or anything in my presentation, so I included some pictures of my pets here. Hope that makes up for it. Um, my Twitter handle's up there. I have a blog post that has a lot of this content up at that URL. Um, I'd like to thank Eric and Glenn for working with me on this for the last 10 months, a lot of this, and helping me extensively with the presentation as well. We have a gym, um, there's a link to it up there, that uh, has a lot of the examples from this uh, talk, and you can use it in your own app if you want, or we'd love to get feedback on how useful it is, or what other features would be nice, or contributions to it. So, to close, if you don't remember anything, any of the specific examples, the Capybara, the RSpec, or any of the techniques in, in this talk, I hope it's at least motivated you to take a look at your test code and treat it as actual code that you're going to have to maintain instead of just a kind of an afterthought or an accessory to code, uh, to your code. Um, and if you're at, at a startup that doesn't have very much code, right now you might think, oh, this is not, it's gonna be a waste of time to implement all these page objects and everything. But if you're ten, five, 10 years down the line when you have um, much more uh, code and uh, many more tests, it'll start getting really complicated and you'll wish that you had followed this. <laughs> so 
Um, thank you to the organizers, and uh, thank you all for listening.